are very excited to dwell into the holistic approach towards zero carbon with our esteemed speaker, architect Ashok Lalji. I've heard him many times, and every time his presentations are completely different. And I am sure he will leave you mesmerized for the next 15 minutes. Mr. Lal's background is very impressive. He studied architecture and fine arts at the University of Cambridge and the Architectural Association in London. He actively contributes to the development of architectural curriculum in India and is a strong advocate for sustainable architecture. Mr. Ashok Lalji, you have 15 minutes to mesmerize the audience. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Gurmit. In the second session for the debate, I need to, and we would like to, I need to look this way so that I know what I'm talking about, actually. So um, I've added, yeah. Yeah, I think that's easier. A good idea. Thanks. So um, you, you notice that there is a subtitle to this. It's the India story. So I'm going to take a very large view of what we are facing today as a country. And it is within that context of change that we are going to see that we have to see how we fit in from our various um, expertise and perspectives. Okay. Um, you, you saw my guest over there on the right hand side, right? Now, he was a guest over on a very celebrated occasion very recently, and so he's my guest over here. How does this move forward? Next. Yeah. Uh, this looks like a bit of a complicated pro uh, diagram, but it's extremely ex uh, instructive, extremely instructive. What you'll see here is a description of carbon emissions contribution globally, country-wise. What we see also is a per capita measure country-wise, all right, per capita carbon emissions country-wise. USA is 14.4 tons of carbon emission, uh, emissions per annum per capita. And what's our budget, according to the experts, our budget, per capita budget globally, is 2.3 tons. Here the dotted line. See 2.3 tons? China has exceeded it. Europe has exceeded it. Many countries are now exceeding it. India is still short of it. It's 1.7 or 1.8. In other words, as a democratic right, we can go up to 2.3. We can consume a bit more carbon or emit a bit more carbon uh, in pursuit of our development goals. Um, but you can see that we should, now it's our responsibility as global citizens to see that we don't exceed that 2.3 line. All right? And that's an important number to remember. Okay. Cities are growing. I hardly need to say anything about that. And this is of some time ago. You can, this is 2011. Next one. 2031, we'll have many more big cities, and cities will continue to grow. And what's happening, according to the last census and today's reporting, is that the middle-sized cities are growing faster than the largest ones. All right? And that's where we really need to focus our attention now. Middle-sized cities growing faster. As India becomes the world's most populous country with populations urbanizing rapidly, what happens in Indian cities in the coming two decades will dis determine our climate, uh, future for climate change. All right, next. It's the largest national urban transformation of the 21st century. Um, there is so many more urban dwellers that are going to come. And there will be five to six billion square meters of residential building that will be built in the next two or three decades. Just, just look at that number. And what you do to this is going to be the determinant on whether you're on this side of climate change or you've gone over the cliff. Next. Hardly need to explain this. Growth of cities. I switched this off. 
I don't need to explain this, this is the growth of cities. They are growing geographically and they're intensifying. And this is causing some issues. Next. Let me just put this out. Urban development policy, which encompasses the regeneration of the existing cities and their expansion, must be directed by a central objective of producing low carbon built environments as cities, not just as buildings. That's important, right? Another thing, and we see this in Mumbai, we see this in Pune, we see this in Ahmedabad, we see everywhere. It is urban development and town planning regulations that determine the nature of buildings that are built and not the other way around. It's not the way buildings are built that determine what the city is. It is now with town planning, rising FSI and so on, but town planning is determining what's going to happen to our cities. Next. So I'm just an advocate of this thing. I'm just saying adopt low rise high density as the DNA of urban morphology in the city's regeneration and expansion to enable cities to approach to enable cities to approach net zero emissions. A good rule there. While becoming resilient, being affordable for low income citizens of the city. Much of the urbanization is going to take place is poor people looking for better opportunities. And it's got to be affordable. It's got to be decent. This DNA will enable the nation, it is this DNA that will enable the nation to fulfill its promise of reducing the GDP intensity of carbon emissions, which is, if you don't follow this DNA, I can bet you we'll not get there. Next. Some very interesting research um, done recently by ICLE, and it is really a measure of uh, per capita carbon emissions city-wise, all right? You'll find the cities that are spread out have very high per capita uh, carbon emissions. Cities that are compact have relative less, all right? So, and this merely because of the, of the transportation networks, mostly because of that. But what this picture misses out, and you can see Panaji is ridiculously high. You wouldn't have thought it. Per capita is very high. Siliguri is ridiculously high, but Baroda is much more, com much more compact. But you know what it does? It looks at the today's operational energy, what we do as a running of the city, but it does not look at the bomb of embodied carbon, carbon emissions attributable to city growth with the doubling of building stock compressed into just two decades. This hasn't yet taken into account what's going to happen with the embodied carbon of construction. It hasn't done that yet, right? Next. What's happening to our bylaws? FSI, Sandeep, right? Yeah, we were just talking about it the other day. Um, the model building bylaws, which are still at the center of the government, 1.5 is what they talk about. But uh, Ahmedabad, Ring Road, FSI of four, Mumbai, four in some areas. Delhi has now gone to 3.5. Surat has gone to five FSR. You know, what does it mean? What does it mean? Buildings are going to get taller and taller and taller. If you have this as the permissible FSI, you're making cities with taller and taller buildings, aren't you? You're doing that. Okay, next. We did a survey of more than 100 affordable housing projects across the country. We looked at the relationship between building height and cost and tried to find out where does the cost lie. Essentially, the taller the building, the more expensive it is. Common sense. But where does that cost come from? It comes from what is gray. Gray is steel, or I don't know. Uh, yeah, the gray is steel, and then it's concrete. The increase in the consumption or the intensity of steel and concrete consumption per square meter of built space is what costs more as you go taller and taller. So you're becoming less affordable. But then there's something else very interesting. Steel happens to be a very high embodied carbon material. It's not only costing you more, but it's also costing you much more carbon emissions. Next. 
And we are insisting in our great wisdom to pack everybody, no matter what your level of income and what your history and what your culture, into affordable housing projects like this. Beautiful. Who was just talking about, um, you were just talking about, you know, with the environment and relationship with the, can you tell me about the relationship with the environment of this one? Lovely, isn't it? And you know, once this is built, it's going to last how many years? 70 years. That means I'm a prisoner of that life for 70 years. Next. What we have in much of our country is at the bottom. Two, three stories, trees, not so dense, but still compact. Not so dense, but still compact. That's where we are. And this is where we are going to. Tall buildings, urban heat island takes over. It gets hotter outside. You have air conditioning. The air conditioners pump out more heat outside. You need more air conditioning. And then everybody needs a car because that's what the bylaws ask for. How much parking space per, per home? Two, two and a half? And what do you do? You, you have cars at the foot of your building that can't move. We've all seen that. And what do they do with the engines on? They make more heat inside the city. So that's the city you are moving towards. All right? And this is what we have. And we can probably make it even more efficient. Next. I'll just um, give you uh, some research that we did recently, just a year and a half back. During the heat wave in, in Gujarat, OK. Here's a good, well-designed project. Here's a building-as-usual project. Next. This is measurement of temperatures inside and outside the building. All right? What you see in black line is the temperature five feet above the roof of the building. Five feet above the roof of the building in black line. Um, the meteorological temperature was somewhere around 38, 40, 42. But above the roof, it was hitting 45 plus. How come? This is urban heat island effect. And those who are living in the top story is the blue line. Their indoor temperature is going past 35 degrees centigrade inside their house, under the roof. Why? Because it's getting so hot above the roof, and the roof is not insulated. Okay, next slide. Well, this is what's happening to our lovely Mumbai. And this year, we talked about Mumbai um, pollution levels suddenly going up. We wonder why it might be. What is the reason behind it? Some people talk of climatic things, some Western disturbance, something over the Arabian Sea. But it's the city itself, I can tell you, that is primarily responsible. Next. Some more research that was done by us. Embodied carbon intensity, that means how much embodied carbon there is per square meter of built area. If you've got a four-story building, it's 233 units. Six-story buildings, 251 units. 12-story building, 310 units. That means the taller you go, the greater the embodied carbon. Right? So why do we want to go taller? If you want to come cut down on carbon emissions, why do you want to get taller? And don't forget that it is the carbon emissions of construction, not the operation of buildings, that is going to be the main thing to look after for the next two decades. Because air conditioning for most people is coming later, not just now. This is going to be the big thing. Next. Operational energy, lifts, pumps, and so on. Well, if you've got a four or five story high building, very little. High rise building, it's gone up I don't know how many times. So your operational energy has also gone up because you're going taller. Next. Maintenance cost, which is the simpler building to maintain? The short one or the tall one? Well, we can see what the results are. This is lifetime maintenance cost. Lifts need changing, pumps need changing, fire, firefighting systems need upgrading, etc., etc. Next. Fantastic finding in research. This is the key. This is the key. Because if you're four to five stories tall, 
60% of roof devoted to solar PV can meet 80% of your annual energy needs. 80%. So getting to near net zero now, if you can do that. First, you've got, you've got to make your buildings efficient themselves, and then you can do that. As you go taller, five, six, seven stories high, only 50%. And if you go taller then, not more than 30%, if you go taller still, forget it. You can't do it. All right? We have a huge program now promoting solar PV. The prime minister thinks it's the best thing he's done in the whole, you know, in his lifetime. It's the biggest thing he's done. But if he doesn't tell you that you don't build so tall so that you can't do solar PV, and if he doesn't tell you that if you build tall, you'll overshadow somebody who's next to you, then he's not done his job yet. He has to tell you that to optimize solar PV potential in cities, four or five story, clear the tree line, catch the sun, shade with solar PV, enjoy a good life. Near net zero. Next. Well, we sum it all up. Let's just sum it all up. But I just want to bring to you one additional point. Apart from cost, affordability, and so on, we know the environmental impacts. We know that a lower building has lesser environmental impact compared to a very tall building. Disaster breakdown and resilience. I've been asking people that there's a big fire in your building. A big fire in your building. Which building would you like to live in? Which building would you like to live in? There's a big earthquake. Which building would you like to live in? The water supply stops and electricity breaks down for a week. It happened in New York, right? It's also happened here in Mumbai. Which building would you like to live in? Which system is more resilient? A low, medium rise system is more resilient. Okay? So here's QED. Next. So you, you know, people talk about densities. How will you get the densities that you need, etc.? Look, boss, do your calculation. You can get 300 to 400 dwelling units per hectare, right, with around 30, 35% ground coverage. Your, these building costs are a little old, maybe they're a little taller. 80% solar potential, a huge amount of carbon dioxide emissions saved as compared to eight, 10 story high buildings, huge amount saved. Quicker construction time. And one more interesting point, just don't forget this one. What are cities about? What is urbanization about? The urbanization system or the design of urbanization is the greatest opportunity of the nation for distribution of wealth to reducing the inequalities of the city. Right? When you have, you know, 20 story high buildings, in Mumbai, how many tekadars can you correct? 20 story high buildings? Five? Six tekadars? Who will come forward? When you have four or five story high buildings, how many tekadars can you get? 500? 2,000? Right? So you get much more participation of the semi-skilled skilled labor force in the building industry from all over the country in the construction of the city, and distribution of wealth happens much faster. Very important part of the DNA of urbanization. Next. Tell me when it's time. Right, can we move on? Next. I'll just show you how it can be done. This is a project that's been built. All right, this is in Chennai. Next. Simple, affordable housing, good climatic design, daylighting, ventilation, insulation, insulated roof, uh, just some simple principles that you have to adopt, orientation being one of them, and the possibility of roof-mounted solar PV. Next. Here is what it looks like. See what's outside the walls, the windows? There's a framework. What does that framework enable you to do? Next. It enables you to shade. Shade outside, shade outside the glass. Don't shade inside the glass, shade outside the glass. That's the best thing to do. Stop the sun outside, otherwise the house will get heated up. So simple. And this is, this is not mandated by regulations. And builders refuse to do it. I can't understand it. Next. High-end building. Can we move quickly to the next few pictures? This is a high-end building. Highly insulated, 
with a cool courtyard in the middle with vertical plantation and roof, uh, roof garden and a pool that cools the water down by a, by a fountain. Next. And this cool water is then circulated through the slab of the building. All right. So it's so well protected, shading, insulation, a cool environment surrounding the building is so well protected that it hardly needs any air conditioning. Next. This is a picture of the courtyard. Next. This is how the, the cooling system works. It's embedded in this floor slab. Next. And the gentleman in the fourth floor, they've installed their own solar PV. He has an electric car, a high performance electric car. And now with solar PV and very efficient air conditioned comfort around the year, he is net zero. He is net zero. All right. So here, the trick is that all four flats that are here can be net zero. And you'll have sufficient roof area if you stick to four to five stories high. Next. We'll go through it now rather quickly. This is a net zero building that's coming up in Hyderabad. Um, and it's net zero on site. Solar PV on the roof, air conditioned offices, still plus five stories. Next. We use for designing the adaptive comfort model as a base for design. We got the clients to accept that bus, 27 degrees, 27 and a half degrees, with a little bit of ceiling fan circulating in the air, is what you should expect. It'll be perfectly comfortable. Come and stay with me. They said, yes, this is OK. I know it works. Don't ask for 25 degrees. Don't ask for 24 degrees. That's one way of reducing your need. OK? Next. And we use the dry season, the dry air of Hyderabad, to cool the water, store it in a big store, and then circulate that cool water through the slabs and add a little bit of air conditioning. So you first protect the building completely, then you do very efficient air conditioning, and with solar PV you can meet all the requirements of the building, up to five stories tall. You go taller than that, it will not work. Next. Okay, we can carry on. Next. I think, I think I'll just stop here now, just to give you the, um, the big message that it is urban development norms and guidelines that will determine the potential of net zero or near zero city development in the future. If we go in the opposite direction, as we are tending to do today, you are not fulfilling the promise that you've made to the world. Thank you.